help protect these fish and their habitats. Keeping ornamental fishes in home aquariums is one of the most popular hobbies in the entire world, especially in the European Union and North America. Over 1,500 fish species are kept in aquariums, and this hobby industry is valued at over $1 billion per year, with fish imports about $300 million of that. This level of trade could be unsustainable, but fish conservationists have worked to make it sustainable. Biologists at New England Aquarium have worked since 1991 on Project Piaba, a program that works with local fisher people in the Rio Negro region of the Amazon to protect tropical ornamental fish and pristine tropical forests. Piaba means little fish in Portuguese, and the name was chosen because little fish are used to protect forests of trees and the clean water that flows through them. Fisher people in the Amazon rely on collecting millions of cardinal tetras and other ornamental fish from pristine forest waters to sustain their local economy and to keep river waters clean for this economic activity. The fisher people also need to help protect their local tropical forests from development and overcutting. Of the 27,000 fishes on earth today, Almost 6,000 are found in the Amazon, and it's 1,000 plus tributaries spread across tropical South America. The Amazon basin holds almost one-fifth of all the freshwater in the entire world. The thousands of Amazonia fish species include the arapaima, one of the largest freshwater fish in the world, many catfishes and piranhas, and the tiny fish that are commonly kept in home aquariums and are farmed by the local fisher people involved in Project Piaba, such as the blue and red cardinal tetra and gold and black discus. The discus, like other bony fishes, has a bony operculum or gill covering that protects the gills used for respiration and their delicate, highly vascularized gill filaments. Water is drawn in through the mouth and out over the gills in a one-way flow when the operculum moves and through muscle contraction around the gill chambers. Fish gills have a large surface area made of thin filaments that are rich with blood vessels. And as water is actively moved through the mouth, across the gills, and out the single pair of gill slits, oxygen is extracted from the water via diffusion. The capillary-based oxygen extraction system enables lower oxygen blood moving along the interface with the cold water that passes across the thin capillary membranes in the gills to absorb new oxygen. This oxygenated blood returning from the gills then delivers oxygen to the rest of the body and across cell membranes within the body, leaving oxygen behind and carrying carbon dioxide back to the gills for another exchange with the water. Some bony fishes can remove up to 85% of dissolved oxygen from water passing over their gills. Discus symphysodon as a group are colorful, beautiful tropical fish species that get along well in home aquariums with tetras. These cichlid fish species are not very sexually dimorphic, although some breeders have observed that solid red discus females are often more brightly colored than males. Spawning can occur twice annually over a period when females lay eggs weekly, at which time the eggs are produced in masses in upside down cup-like structures. Cichlids are famous for parental care for their newly hatched young, called larvae. In most cichlid species, including discus, care of young is highly developed and both parents care for the young. This is called brood care. Adult discus produce an amazing secretion through their skin that their larval offspring eat during the first few days after hatching. This behavior of fish larvae eating secretions off parental skin has also been observed for other fish species. In captivity, the larval fish may live off their parents' skin secretions for up to two weeks. In the wild, they would be receiving protection from predators by remaining close to their larger parents. All bony fishes also have a pouch of tissue along the esophagus 
called a diverticulum. And this may provide an additional method of gas exchange in species like lungfish, in which the diverticulum is a functional lung. In fishes that use these pouches primarily for buoyancy, the diverticulum is called a swim bladder. Gas from the blood diffuses into the swim bladder by way of a gas gland, causing the fish to rise. To release gas when the fish gets too high in the water column, a muscular valve opens up and allows gas to enter a very vascular area of the swim bladder called an ovale, and from there diffuse back into the blood. Human scuba divers know that the neutral buoyancy achieved by bony fishes is only achieved by us via weight belts and very controlled breathing. So these swim bladders in fishes are a truly wondrous adaptation. Although discus fish produce small numbers of larvae that they can then care for, tetras, including cardinal tetras, are big bang breeders like many other fish and produce hundreds of young. The tetras are relatively common in forest streams that are shaded by overhanging vegetation. This streamside vegetation produces a lot of detritus, which then provides nutrients for the fishes downstream. There are two seasons in this habitat, and during the dry season, the fish tend to form large schools in the center of the stream where leaves collect and provide shelter to the schools of tiny adult fish. In the wet season, the rains flood the streams, which overflow their banks into the surrounding forest. The fish swim higher in the water column and into the forest where they find protection among tree roots. The males display their bright red stomachs to the slightly larger and more rotund females. The fish mate, then spawn around midnight, each female laying 100 to 150 eggs in floating mats of moss or in substrate where they are safe from egg predators. Tetra larvae hatch 24 to 36 hours later and become free swimming three to four days later. So, from the millions of tetra in the flooded forest come hundreds of millions more tetras, and most would not survive through the next dry season when water volume is reduced. So this brings us back to Project Piaba. Catching thousands of tetras for export is both ecologically and economically sustainable because it saves fish that would otherwise die during the dry season. The families who have been catching cardinal tetras and discus by hand in the same clean river area for years use hand-woven nets and select only the tiny fish they want to sell. The others are released back into the river right where they are caught. The colorful fish are then held in pens in forest communities before they're transported down the river for export. They're transported in plastic bins using safe practices and then eventually reside in aquariums around the world. The communities even have a big celebration when these fish are caught for export to home aquarium hobbyists. An annual Piaba festival celebrates the fisher people of the Rio Negro region of Brazil. Barcelos, a town on the Rio Negro, hosts the festival and the population of the town doubles during the event. The Cardinal Tetra and Discus Fisher People groups compete in friendly games in a performance space built just to host the festival in the tropical forest. The local Fisher People are from ancestral groups and they are born into either the Tetra Specialist or Discus Specialist group. During the friendly competitions, they gain or lose points based on how respectful they are of the other group's performance. If your team cheers for the other team, you gain points. If your team is not cheering, or if they leave early, then your team loses points. Brazil hosts a celebration the night before the start of the fishing season to honor the Piaberas and Piaberos for their work. So, these fisher people of the Amazon protect the local rainforest, take large numbers of fish in a sustainable way, and help to sustain their local economy as well. The locals make up to 60% of their income through this ecologically sustainable fish harvesting. It is a true story of how a species of spectacular bony fishes 
help local humans protect their local ecosystem. Did you ever wonder how amphibians adapt themselves to living in water and on land at different times in their lives? And if their adaptations for breeding and eating are affected by our impacts on the world's environments? Or have you ever simply looked at a live frog in a pond and wondered, is that a frog or a toad? In this lecture, we'll explore amphibian biology and adaptations. We'll cover topics including amphibian diversity, frog and salamander body shapes, what different amphibians eat, and how we can help amphibians thrive on our planet. And here's a reminder for you, your families, and friends before we even start. Sometimes it's easy to touch or hold a frog, toad, or salamander, and you should always wash your hands after touching animals as a matter of good hygiene. This is especially true for amphibians, since they might have toxins or bacteria on the surface of their skin. We love frogs and even toads. The Frog Prince, Mr. Toad, and of course, Jim Henson's friend, Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog, in fact, was so famous as a TV and movie star that he now lives at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and has for over 20 years. Frogs and other amphibians clearly are important animals in human culture and artistry. Most human cultures love frogs and other amphibians. Amphibians are an ancient group, older than the dinosaurs. They were the earliest land-dwelling vertebrates, first invading this alien environment about 375 million years ago. Their fossils have been found on every continent, including Antarctica. The age of amphibians began when lobe-finned fish ancestors crawled up out of the water and started leading their double lives in water and on land a lifestyle that has survived robustly into our modern times. An incredible, well-preserved lobe fin fish fossil named Tiktaalik was found in 2004. This fish appears to have developed the adaptations necessary to thrive in shallow water tropical swamps that existed on our planet during those ancient epochs. The Tiktaalik has a pelvic girdle which means that the creature could use its proto-limbs to move out of the water and onto shore to hunt prey around the mudflats of swampy waters and streams. In fact, all of Tiktaalik's physical features have the possibility of being the evolutionary transition from fish to amphibians and other four-legged animals, or tetrapods, including the later evolving reptiles, birds, and mammals. Large amphibians were most abundant about 350 million years ago and must have been very scary since they grew up to 12 feet long with huge jaws lined with rows of sharp teeth. In our modern world, amphibians are still found in diverse environments from the moist tropics through dry deserts to cold areas of the northern forest, although they all need some kind of dampness to maintain their moist skins. The only continent the world's amphibians don't live on today is Antarctica, which has been frozen full-time for about 15 million years. The word amphibian can be divided into its two roots. Amphi means both, or two, and bio means life, two lives, one in the water and one on land. Amphibians begin life in eggs that are typically deposited in water in large groups called egg masses. The freshwater bodies where the eggs are laid are often those that are most likely to be predator-free ephemeral pools that are dry most of the year, but are formed by spring rains, or maybe the shallowest parts of a pond where predators cannot move easily. The eggs are externally fertilized 
as they are laid and may form large clumps, as in frog egg masses, or long strings, as in toad egg masses. The amphibian embryo develops inside the egg into the tadpole stage. The fish-like tadpoles have no legs after hatching and have gills for absorbing oxygen from the water, as well as strong tail fins to help them swim fast and avoid underwater predators. In these early developmental stages, frog and toad tadpoles have what looks like an enlarged head on the fish-like tail. The head will grow into the body and head of the adult, while the tail will be lost. Salamander tadpoles look more like fish in their more streamlined shape, and all salamanders keep their tails as adults. We often see clusters of tadpoles in the local pond or temporary spring pools in the woods. These clusters probably offer safety for the group. Large numbers of tadpoles help individual siblings avoid predation if a predator like an aquatic insect or a fish finds the group. Some scientists also think that swimming in a group may keep the tiny babies warm. Tadpoles mostly eat algae and sometimes very small, slow, water-dwelling creatures. Tadpoles of salamanders and large frogs may also eat crustaceans and even one another, especially as their mouths get wider as they grow. When they have eaten enough and reach a particular size, tadpole shape and even body parts begin to change. This biological process is called metamorphosis, which means changing shape or form. Tadpoles develop their external hind legs first, while the front legs are forming behind the head but hidden under the skin. As the tadpole changes, its eyes bulge more as well. It loses its gills and it begins to look more like an adult. As the growing amphibian becomes ready to live on land, it begins to look a lot less like a fish and more like an adult of its species. Adult amphibians have wider mouths, bigger tongues, and are more carnivorous and eat insects, worms, and other food. The adult amphibian's mouth and diet, head and body shape, way of breathing and behavior have all changed through the extraordinary biological process of metamorphosis. Nearly 90% of the world's almost 7,000 known amphibians are frogs and toads, while only about 10% are salamanders, and less than 3% are limbless, worm-like creatures known as Sicilians. All amphibians have a permeable skin and are different from mammals, birds, and reptiles in not having a hairy, feathery, or scaly covering over their bare, moist skin and in needing a damp or watery environment for their eggs and tadpoles. Most amphibians are small because they need to live in places where there is ample moisture to keep their skin moist. The smallest of all known amphibians is a newly discovered frog that lives in forest leaf litter in New Guinea. So small that several adults of these frogs, called Pitophrine amoensis, can fit on the surface of a single dime together. The largest living amphibian is the almost six foot long Chinese giant salamander. And it should be no surprise that the world's giant salamanders live in water most of the time. The giant salamanders are ugly, almost terrifying looking creatures with beady eyes and big mouths, actually quite similar to the creature scientists describe from Tiktaalik fossils and with wrinkled skin that hangs in folds along the sides of their bodies to aid in gas exchange with water. Amphibians are a truly a diverse group. Salamanders have long tails and short legs and look a bit like lizards, but have moist rather than scaly skin. The United States has the greatest diversity of salamanders in the world concentrated in our Appalachian Mountain and West Coast moist habitats. You may have seen these creatures before, although they are difficult to find even when numerous. They are active mostly at night or during dark rainy days, and they are fond of damp, darkened hiding places in leaf litter 
under logs, and between rocks. Let's go back to the National Zoo and meet Lauren Augustine, a biologist in the Appalachian Salamander Lab. She's going to tell us about these fascinating creatures. Lauren, here we are in Smithsonian's Appalachian Salamander Lab. What got you interested in salamanders? One of the things I find so fascinating about salamanders is how diverse they are. And so I was lucky enough to go to school in Asheville, North Carolina, an area where there is a lot of different kinds of salamanders. And so I was able to go out in the field in some of my classes and actually go out and see salamanders in the wild. And so that really sparked my passion for this species. The United States has the largest diversity of salamanders in the entire world. And here we are with a model of a hellbender and live hellbenders in tanks behind us. Can you talk about the small salamanders and the big salamanders and their amphibian lives, their lives in water and on land? Yeah, so salamanders are very diverse. They can be anywhere from as big as the six foot giant Chinese salamander or as small as the one inch steep salamander. So great diversity in sizes. But they also can be fully aquatic like the hellbender and the other giant salamanders. Or they can be pretty terrestrial and live their lives fully on land or both in the land and in the water. So some salamanders will lay their eggs in the water and they will hatch into larvae, which then will metamorphose into adult salamanders on land. And some salamanders will lay their eggs on land and they will actually keep them moist and wrap around them until they hatch into salamanders. And so they're really cool and very different life strategies. Can you talk a little bit about the biomass of salamanders? I understand the biomass of redback salamanders is one of the highest uh, in northern forests of all the vertebrates. And what's their important role in the ecosystem? Yeah. So. Although people rarely see salamanders because they are hidden down under the leaf litter or under logs or even mole salamanders will burrow into the ground, there are lots of salamanders out there. In some deciduous forests, redback salamander, the biomass or the weight of those individuals in that area will outweigh other vertebrates, so even deer. And so there are lots of salamanders out there and they play a very vital role in our ecosystem. We often refer to them as nutrient savings accounts. Because they are so abundant and so long lived, they are contributing up the food chain all the energy. And so they're eating all the little decomposers on the forest floor and passing that energy up the food chain. Wow. So all salamanders have to have a moist environment because they don't have a watertight skin. And so here we're holding a model of this hellbender that we see in the tank. And these guys breathe in a different way than the small salamanders. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so salamanders can breathe in three different ways. So some salamanders are pedomorphic, which means they retain their juvenile characteristics, which is their gills, which they have as larvae. And so animals like uh, the mud puppy will retain its gills and breathe through those as adults. But animals like the hellbender, they actually have lungs, but don't use them to breathe. They actually respire through their highly specialized skin and they'll use their lungs for buoyancy in the water. But that's why hellbenders have all these crazy folds down their sides to increase the surface area for oxygen absorption. And then there's a whole group of terrestrial salamanders that we call lungless salamanders that actually breathe fully through their skin and the tissue in their mouths. And so for their highly, yeah, for their highly specialized skin to work, it needs to be moist. Why are you studying salamanders here in the Appalachian Salamander Lab? Which species do you have here? And why is it important to study them? So we are looking at salamanders and how they're infected by their environment. Because they do have this highly specialized skin, we, also ref we often refer to them as environmental indicators. Their skin is very sensitive and they will respond quickly to environmental change. And so they're a good species to look at ecosystem health. And so here in the Appalachian Salamander Lab, we study how temperature changes might be affecting the stress levels and the immune response of hellbenders in particular. But we also have in this lab redback salamanders, which are one of the most common salamanders in the world. And the biggest threats to salamanders, much like a lot of other species, are habitat destruction. And of course, this affects salamanders both in aquatic and terrestrial habitats because decreased forest, forested area increases runoff, which then increases siltation in the water, which is one of the major threats to hellbenders because the siltation will settle on the eggs and stop them from developing. Because they're so small, because they live under the leaf litter, People rarely see these salamanders. Why should people care? So that's one of the main reasons that here at the National Zoo we have the Salamander Lab and the Salamander Exhibit 
is to not only just bring attention to these really important species, but also show why they are so important as ecosystem engineers like we're trying to demonstrate with the hellbender experiments. Salamanders are a wonderful and important group of creatures, but now I want to jump over to frogs. Frogs and toads are fascinating. They are the noisy members of the amphibian group, and along with birds and a few mammals, they're the only vertebrates we know of that use mating vocalizations. Different frogs have different songs, chirps, and croaks, and a citizen science project called Frog Watch USA trains students, backyard scientists, and others to listen for different songs and identify frogs in their area. These citizen scientists are building a better database of where frogs range. How do we tell the difference between frogs and toads? Believe it or not, scientifically, there is no true distinction. Both frogs and toads belong to the order Aneura, from the Greek term for tailless. Beneath that taxonomic level, there is a family of so-called true toads, the Buphonidae. But it, when it comes to species names, many of the creatures we call toads are technically frogs, and many of the creatures we call frogs are technically toads. So really, it's a distinction in nomenclature without a difference in biology. That said, there are some physical characteristics that generally belong to things called frogs and other characteristics that belong to things called toads. But it's important to keep in mind that there are always exceptions when we talk about thousands of species of animals, so we'll say in general for those differences. Both frogs and toads are amphibians without tails. The bulging eyes and nostrils of frogs are on the tops of their heads, enabling these creatures to breathe and see while they are hidden in the water or hidden in some plants. Frogs will be found in or near water, unlike the land-loving toads, so the animals you see in the local pond are probably frogs. Frogs will have smoother skin than toads, which have bumpier skin. Behaviorally, frogs are more timid than toads, and frogs will jump away if startled, while a toad may just sit still. Frogs normally have larger, more muscular legs adapted for big jumps and feet for strong swimming, while toads have relatively shorter legs designed for short hopping. In the hundreds of different body forms, toads and frogs have evolved for swimming, jumping, hopping, burrowing, and climbing, it is not always possible to label a frog or a toad in any place in the world. But in the United States, these generalizations will often help you determine which is which. Jumping is a great defense for amphibians that blend in with their environments but taste good. Another good defense is to be active at night, so it is more difficult for predators to find them. Poison dart frogs of the tropics, on the other hand, are colorful, move slowly, and are active during the daytime. So skin toxins are perfect for frogs with this warning coloration and behavioral ad adaptations. Toads also produce toxins through the warty looking bumps on their skin. And these glands, especially the ones near a toad's eyes or ears, produce repelling or poisonous substances that protect them from predators. So toads don't need to jump quickly out of the way. If a predator even licks a poisoned dart frog or toad glands, it can get very sick, it can be paralyzed, or it can even die. Toxins are anti-predator adaptations. Frogs and toads are supreme predators. Scientists have estimated that one toad can eat 200 bugs in a single evening. And this is amazing because a toad has a short tongue and needs to walk up to its prey and get it into its mouth. Frogs have long sticky tongues that they shoot rapidly at their prey. Frog tongues are attached at the backs of their mouths rather than at the front like our tongues are. The frogs flip their sticky tongues out and the sticky ends grab onto the prey insect. When a frog or toad has an insect in its mouth, 
there is the action of swallowing it. Both creatures have bulging eyes, and when they blink during eating, they push their eyes backwards toward their mouths, and their eyes actually help push the food down into the creature's throats. Yum! Despite their amazing adaptations, frogs are in trouble around the world. There are an estimated 10 million species of living things on our small planet, and only about 1.5 million have been described. And of these, only 7,000 are amphibians. Biodiversity is a term that was coined by Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson in 1986. In layman's terms, the word refers to the total variety of life in a particular place or ecosystem, although zoologists also use it to refer to genetic variation at a population or individual level. One of the major aims of zoologists today is to preserve biodiversity, because an ecosystem can be like a house of cards. Remove one card or species and the whole thing can fall apart. We really know very little about our natural world, and we don't want to destroy our fragile environments before we even know what amphibians and other species live there. Brazil has the largest number of amphibians known for any country, more than 1,000. The United States has the largest diversity of salamanders. There are seven families and over 180 species of these mostly tiny, almost lizard-like amphibians living north of Mexico, where they have evolved in relative isolation since the last ice age. Amphibian diversity varies by habitat. In moist lowlands, there are lots of species of amphibians. There is the northern tree frog that is one of the only amphibians that can withstand freezing temperatures in Alaska and Canada. And there is one Mexican salamander that lives over 15,000 feet above sea level on the relatively dry Orizaba volcano. But even the tough amphibian species are disappearing. The 2008 International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red List of Endangered and Threatened Species lists about 17,000 animals and plants across the planet that face extinction. And scientists think that there are many more species that will disappear over the next century. Over 90% of all known amphibians were evaluated for the red list. And at least 30% of all amphibians are now considered threatened by human-caused threats as diverse as habitat loss, pollution, overexploitation, introduced species, climate change, and disease. Since 1980, we think over 120 species of amphibians have gone extinct. We also believe amphibians are sensitive bioindicators for ecological threats, so can help humans identify environmental threats early for three reasons. First, amphibians' permeable skin absorbs toxic chemicals and therefore reflects toxicity in their environments. Second, Amphibian species are exposed to double jeopardy from environmental stressors because they live both in water and on land. And third, amphibians' jelly-coated eggs don't have much protection from the environment. Smithsonian scientists are passionate about saving amphibians, partly because the great diversity of salamanders is in our own backyard in the Appalachian Mountains. We study emerging diseases of amphibians and the amphibians themselves in National Zoo's amphibian lab and also in nature. In 1999, Smithsonian scientists working with others in academia discovered a new fungus, the chytrid fungus, that was killing amphibians in the Americas. Let's go talk with Brian Gratwick at the National Zoo about the discovery of this emerging disease. So frogs are amphibians, amphibio, two lives, water and land, tadpole and adult. Does chytrid affect the tadpole uh, more than it affects the adult? How does the chytrid fungus work biologically? So the chytrid fungus is a, a small um, microscopic fungus that infects the skin of the frogs. And what happens is you'll have a little spore land on the skin and burrow into it. 
and then it'll grow. And eventually it'll form a sporangium, which is the fruiting body of the fungus, that then releases all these little swimming spores out into the environment. And they swim like little tadpoles, and they're actually chemotactic. They can sniff out frogs and swim towards them, and then burrow into their skin, or reinfect the same host where the, 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 the chytrid came from. And when, the, when this fungus infects the skin and builds up to such a level that um, the frog finds it difficult to maintain its iron balance in its body, it eventually results in heart attack and death. Can you talk about Smithsonian's efforts at finding some probiotic or other cure?